will speak about characteristics of coarsening cellular structures in people. Thank you, Constantine. <laughs> um, this is ongoing work um, that I've been I've been pursuing here at the institute um, with Bob McPherson, who's down here in the front row, and Menachem Lazar, who is back there, and then David Strolovitz, um, who is now working at a at a research institute in Singapore. Um, so I came to this through the study of uh, materials, through material science. Um, and the reason this is pertinent to, to materials is because if you take, if you take a, a metal, almost any metal that you would encounter in your day-to-day -day life, uh, and you take a section of it, so we have some planar surface now, and you treat it um, with various kinds of acid baths and look at it under a microscope, you see a structure like this. Um, so this is the structure on the level of a micron. These bars here are actually 100 mic micrometers. So we refer to this as the microstructure. Uh, and the microstructure, roughly speaking, it's composed of these uh, individual cells or grains. These are single crystals, single crystal grains. And the interfaces on which these meet, which we refer to as grain boundaries. Uh, and so you look at this and you see that the grain boundaries form some three regular graph. Um, so we have these vertices where three grain boundaries come together. Um, there's no vertices here where you have four grain boundaries or two. Um, and what's more is it looks almost as though it's scale invariant. So these are actually both from samples of uh, polycrystalline steel. Um, these scale bars are in fact the same. So these are at the same magnification. And what you notice is that if you take this structure and you were to scale it down, you would be able to superimpose it over some part of this, at least approximately in some statistical sense. Um, so these structures are uh, approximately scale invariant. Uh, and so we're, we're interested in these. We're interested in, in learning about the geometry and the topology of these structures. So one of the ways that we do that, uh, rather than looking at these experimental microstructures, we form uh, simulated systems. Um, it's actually not so difficult to write up a computer program um, to simulate these things and simulate their evolution and then to begin extracting lots of topological and geometric data. Um, so with regard to grain growth, um, the physical process that you were seeing that resulted in the microstructures on the previous slide, um, we have a model that we've, we've, uh, we've been working on. So in this model system, you have individual cells, individual grains, um, which always meet two at a time on a boundary. Uh, and you have vertices, these red points, where you have three cells meeting at a vertex. Um, we endow this graph, this three regular graph with certain physical properties. Um, so one of them is a boundary energy gamma. Uh, so this boundary energy, it's isotropic. It's the same on every one of these grain boundaries. Um, and it's always the same. It's just a constant. If you allow the system now with this isotropic grain boundary energy um, to evolve just by steepest descent, it's trying to minimize its energy, what's going to happen uh, is it's going to try to reduce its total boundary length. It's actually going to evolve toward the case where it has a single crystal that occupies all space. Um, and specifically what happens is you pick some point on one of these boundaries. That point is going to migrate. It's actually more clear for this one. This point is going to migrate toward its center of curvature at a rate proportional to the curvature locally. Uh, and so we just refer to that as mean curvature flow. So that's, that's the flow that we're imposing on this network. There's various consequences of this. One is that um, the angles around the vertices all converge to 2 pi over 3. Uh, and you can just see that by saying that the boundary energy gamma has equal units to a line tension. And you require that the forces uh, on a vertex balance, right? that the net force be 0. So in that case, um, this condition falls out quite naturally. As a result of mean curvature flow, you get that the rate of change of the area of one of these cells is directly proportional to n, which is the number of sides of that cell, minus 6. So in particular, a six-sided grain does not change area. It stays fixed for all time um, until the number of sides changes. A five-sided grain will shrink. A four-sided grain will shrink twice as fast as a five-sided one. Seven eight-sided ones will grow. Uh, and so we have. Um, movies. Is it important to specify the rule when two vertices meet? We'll get to that very shortly. Okay, we'll that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually a very important point, but that, that'll be clarified. Um, 
And so in this case, it started from some initial condition, which was a Voronoi tessellation of Poisson distributed points. Um, this is actually on the torus. It's on a flat torus, so opposite edges are identified. Um, and except for some issues with you know, turning this into a movie, just some compression problems, which is why it looks like it jerks a little bit, uh, it's otherwise a smooth evolution. And you can see various kinds of events that are taking place. Uh, you have four-sided grains that, sh that are shrinking. Um, where's a good one? There's occasionally a three-sided grain that vanishes to a point, like right there, which you, you just missed. Um, you have edge, edges flipping. Actually, that happens quite frequently. Um, so when the two vertices come together to a single point, it actually, the connectivity of the graph changes. Um, and then there's also some other events which are much more difficult to see in that kind of presentation. Um, so specifically, we identify three topological events that occur in this movie. Um, one of them is disappearance of a digon. Now, this is very, very difficult to see. Um, this actually happens quite frequently. It was not, uh, for a long time, it was conjectured that this didn't happen. Um, but it's quite clear that it does. It's just the lifetime is very short because the number of sides is so few relative to six. The rate of change of the area is very fast. It's shrinking very quickly. And these are normally small when they appear, so their lifetimes are very short. We also have disappearances of triangles. So this triangle, um, you can calculate it mathematically. It's not too difficult. Um, it can evolve continuously down to a point. So when that happens, the grain just simply disappears, and you're left with a vertex. Um, the only other event that seems to occur in these is the flip of an edge. So in this case, you can imagine some kind of driving force that would bring these two vertices together. And when that happens, because we don't allow uh, for vertices with four edges, you have to change the connectivity of the graph. So that happens by this edge actually flipping, and by the, uh, the cells which are adjacent to each other uh, changing. Um, and in particular, um, if it appears in the simulation that you have grains with more sides than three vanishing, what actually is occurring, as far as we can tell, is it's shedding sides and then disappearing as a trigon, as a triangle except it may disappear as a triangle at such a small point that it's beyond the numerical resolution of the, of the simulation. So I'm going to show that movie again. Um, and this time, you can keep an eye out for those events as they happen, hopefully. You may be better at spotting them than I am. Can, you show us can I show you a flip? There's lots of flips. Um, where, is one, where do I expect one to happen? <laughs> where it's not shrinking. Um, there. For example. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Do you see one, Bob? Do you see an obvious one? <laughs> Part of the problem is your eye is drawn to when a grain dies, right? Because that's the, the biggest event. That's the most action. Um, the grain flip, it's, it's actually, uh, it just, hap just happened at the top. All right. There it was. Stop. There what was? Where? So, OK, here's a good example, right? Here's a, here's a triangle which is going to die in the next few steps. So we can actually. Go back a little bit in time. So you hear. Actually, there's a flip that happened just below it. Oh yeah, there is. It's just below that. This one. Yeah, that's about the flip. I was actually focusing on that, but this is a nice grain, so pay attention to that guy. <laughs> so as I'm just going to push this forward slowly. Yep. So there's the flip. There's actually two of them. Both the bottom and the top oh, of yeah. this guy, yeah. and then this is going to vanish continuously as a, as a triangle. Just ver vanishes right down to a vertex. So is it possible that the vanishing triangles are actually vanishing digons just at very small resolutions? Possible. That's, that's um, yeah, that's an open question. <laughs> if that's true, um, there's, there's very few people who believe that that's possible or that that's what's occurring. But it's, 
it could be. Um, so we also, so in addition to this, this grain growth system, which was the one that I was just showing you, we, uh, we also sometimes work with another system. Um, this is a system of bubbles. So rather than, rather than grains evolving by mean curvature flow, what we have is we have this collection of bubbles in two dimensions. Um, and the bubbles obey basically the same structural, structural rules. You have two bubbles that meet on some edge. You have three bubbles that meet at a vertex, which is again given in red. Uh, we have some isotropic boundary energy, gamma, and that um, for, well, yeah, some isotropic uh, boundary energy, gamma. So the system is going to try to evolve to uh, reduce its total boundary area. We also have the angles converging to 2 pi over 3 as a result of this isotropic boundary energy. Um, the physical mechanism here is gas diffusion. These bubbles contain gas, and it's diffusing through these walls between the cells. And that leads, again, to the same rule, uh, that the rate of change of the area of a bubble is given by, uh, is proportional to the number of sides of the bubble minus 6. Except that, in this case, you have edges of constant curvature, uh, which is nice. That, in some sense, makes the system much easier to deal with than the previous one. And the, the physical reason for this, which is that uh, you have gas coming into this bubble, or escaping the bubble um, during its evolution, but the gas is able to redistribute within the bubble much faster than it actually travels between them. So in some sense, you can think about the system as in every moment being in mechanical equilibrium. And so just as a natural consequence of that, each edge has a constant curvature over its length. Um, and so that seems like a very small change, but if you actually go and look at one of these systems, the behavior is completely different. So the last one was evolving smoothly. You think that it's not such a big, big difference to just make this enforcement that, uh, to just enforce that all the edges be constant curvature, but it becomes this very discontinuous process. And what's more, non-local. Every time you have one of these transitions where you have a bubble disappearing or an edge flipping, I actually have to um, resolve for the locations of all vertices in the system, for all the curvature of all of the boundaries, for all the pressures. This is a very large system of coupled, of coupled equations. So every point in the system affects every other point, which is why you have this, this kind of jumping. But this is, in fact, what you see when you do this experimentally. Um, there's a group down at Penn um, who does this. Um, and you know their bubbles are three dimensions, but three dimensional. Uh, but you can get a good approximation to this by just confining those between plates of glass. Excuse me, how, mm -hmm. how correlated are these large? I'm sorry? How correlated are these large uh, reorientation events? Um, to me that they're recurring avalanches or something like this. So that must have been studied, right? Not as well as you might think. <laughs> yeah, that's, there's a great deal of work to be done here. Um, particularly in cases where this is, so this is just undergoing a process of bubble coarsening, so the bubbles get larger because of gas diffusion. If you did something else to it, if you were to say, attach two pieces of sandpaper to the top and bottom and just start shearing this thing, yep. um, what ends up happening is you store a lot of energy, of deformation in the bubble films. And in that case, it does appear to kind of relax in this avalanche of events. Um, but Possible. Uh, it's also possible that there were just a whole lot of events in a very short time. <laughs> um, yeah. What are the other improvements? Well, the alternative system is an enormous one that you've been MIT or three dimensional one. And in that one, uh, you would occasionally get avalanches of two. That is, some, something would happen here yeah. and it would cause the whole thing to shake and yeah. it would cause a topological yeah. transition at the other end. Yeah, yeah. And you can see that in, 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 yeah. in, in the movie. I mean, and it definitely. It's definitely allowed. There's, there's no locality in that system at all. Um, and so you can. So why, so why has it not been studied? People in other contexts mm -hmm. study these events very seriously, such as in dislocation dynamics, plasticity, and so on. Oh, absolutely. Why, why has it not been studied here? Well, um, there's, uh, there's several reasons, I think. Um, one is that um, there's a lot of experimental complications. So if you actually wanted to do an experiment of this, it's it becomes very, very difficult. Um, if you do it in three dimensions, say, um, you have this, this large problem of just figuring out where the bubble surfaces are. So you say, OK, well, let's do it in two dimensions. 
So you do it in two dimensions, and then the question is, well, those, those edges, those boundaries, are actually uh, fluid, right? And so the, the fluid is not uniformly distributed along the height because of gravity. You also have um, surface tension and coalescence of liquid into the vertices, which means that they don't, especially in the area of the vertices, they don't uh, follow the precise mathematical rules that we were using to evolve that previous system. So you say, well, let's try to simulate it. Um, that system contained maybe uh, 2,000 bubbles. So we were solving on the order of 10,000 simultaneous linear equations. So you imagine saying, well, let's just simulate a system containing a few hundred thousand bubbles and collect really nice statistics. It's not particularly feasible. Um, it's just, it's, I mean, it's an interesting problem. I, I would love to hear that, <laughs> actually. Um, yeah, I would love to talk to you afterwards about that. So we see that this is punctuated by four events. Um, notably, we don't have disappearances of digons. There's no mechanism by which a digon can appear, a two-sided bubble. Because what we would have to do, you would have to have a three-sided bubble that then pulls away. One of the, it would just have to spontaneously pull away, and this edge would have to go to length zero. And there's, there's no mechanism for that to occur. So you can't generate them. This event can't happen. You do still have disappearances of these triangles. Um, and also, interestingly, you can show again, um, without too much difficulty, it seems, that um, four-sided bubbles and five-sided bubbles can shrink continuously to a point without shedding any sides in that process, which is kind of a strange thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, and you also have this edge flip, uh, which occurs in, in both systems again. Um, when they shrink to a point and then disappear into this other configuration, is there a jump? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a, there's a jump in the system associated with every one of these topological events. Every time that happens, it jumps to a in new... gas problem, but not in the first problem. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, in the first problem, every, every motion was continuous, every, every component. Jump. Because it has to move at every moment to a state of mechanical equilibrium. So, uh, you know, this comes together, and then you say, well, let's, let's reorient that. Um, now, I mean, I can, I can yeah. draw it for you. It's not stable at a small... Abs yeah, exactly. A exactly. Yeah, and so there's this very sh fast transition. Um, that's true of all of these. Yeah, and there's actually, it's not quite as simple as this. There's, an, there's a, a two possible configurations after the disappearance yeah. of a four-sided bubble and five, I think, for this one. So how do you pick? Um, I pick on the basis of when this gets, when this, the size of this bubble becomes so small that I'm no longer able to resolve it very well within the confines of my simulation, I identify the edge which is shortest or the edge which is shrinking fastest, they happen to often be the same, right? And I say, well, I'm gonna collapse that one first, and I'm gonna collapse another one. And so, practically speaking, then the simulation breaks it down into a composition of events like this and events like this. Um, but I can show you that again. This is actually, this is one of my favorite videos, um, just precisely because it, it's, it's so non-local. Um, so in this case, I mean, you, I can point out things that there's actually a whole lot of these four-sided bubbles that appear to vanish continuously. Um, Five-sided ones are more rare. Uh, there's more degrees of freedom there, and occasionally what will happen is it'll shed a side before it gets down to that point. And so in that case, it vanished as a three-sided grain um, because it also depends on what's happening in the vicinity. So that actually vanished as a four-sided one. Occasionally, you do find one of these five-sided grains going away, um, five-sided bubbles, excuse me. Um, How do you decide which events are causing other events in the non-local phenomena? Uh, well, I don't. Um, not, not precisely. Uh, what this is, what I'm actually doing is I'm saying, you s I specify the bubble areas. According to that relation that I showed you earlier, I can specify what the bubble areas have to be in the next moment of time. Um, so what I do is I, I um, it's essentially a, a gradient descent algorithm. It's just a nonlinear least square algorithm. And I'm saying, well, I need to get to those areas, and the things that I'm allowed to move around are the locations of the vertices and the pressures of the bubbles. And it just, it just falls down the steepest descent. And if, if that runs through some event where an edge length goes to zero or a cell area goes to zero, then it has to make the transition and then repeat the algorithm. So I'm not explicitly choosing those. So there, you can always, you could find the first event. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
this. But it may, not, uh, it may not reach a point where it's mechanically stable for several events, right? It may go through four or five before it reaches another mechanically stable configuration. And so then there's a question, would they have happened simultaneously in a physical system or not? And that's not clear. Um, so these are very complicated systems, right? Um, you can see that, you can see we start from some initial condition, we put some dynamical flow on it, we end up with some structure. Um, we need to make this precise so we can start studying something. So there's this wide, this long-held conjecture of material science, which is so basic that there's not even a name associated with it. It's just assumed that this is true. Um, so it goes like this. So let's actually constrain ourselves just to grain growth, so the first simulation I showed you. The conjecture says that for almost any initial condition, um, this mean curvature flow will eventually result in some steady state structure. And I have to be precise about almost any initial condition and steady state structure, but uh, just roughly speaking, this is what we see. We see you start out with something like this. This is a, a Voronoi tessellation of Poisson distributed points in the plane. It originally contains, say, n cells. If you evolve this so that the number of cells is one-fourth what it originally was, you might get some picture that looks like this. This is an actual simulation that we ran. And then you keep letting it run. So actually, now we're down to one-hundredth the number of original cells. Right? And you see that these are practically indistinguishable in some statistical sense. I'm not saying that there's a precise isomorphism between the graphs here and here. But just looking at them, it's very difficult to pick up differences. Well, they must be blown up. In fact, yeah. So what I've done is, in every case, um, you're seeing me just rescale space. Rescale so the average size is constant. Size is constant. Yes, that's absolutely right. So these are, these are much, much larger systems. These are small sections of a much larger system containing millions of bubbles. Millions of grains, in this case, I'm sorry. Um, so what does steady state mean? So I mean, you can see you see you see something about the structure there. Um, we can try to make that more precise. So, for example, if you take if you take that system and let it evolve for a very long time, you might measure some statistic. You might say, well, what's the what's the fraction of um, of eight sided eight sided grains? Uh, what's the fraction of nine sided grains, ten sided grains? And so you might get some discrete probability distribution like this. So this is after we've waited for a very, very long time. Uh, and what you see is that as a function of simulation time, it begins to approach that. It starts out from some, some discrete distribution here in red. So what I've done is I've just taken this distribution and subsequent ones appear to the right. They're just offset to the right so you can see the evolution. So you can, for example, follow this peak here. So this occurs at six sides. So you see that that increases as a function of simulation time and then decreases and stabilizes. Um, the number of five-sided grains increases and peaks earlier than the number of six-sided ones does, but it also comes down and stabilizes as a function of time. And you can look at other ones also. So you can trace this evolution, but in every case, every statistic we measure, anyone that you can think of, anyone that we can think of, always reaches some steady state distribution. Which brings us to the next part, which is that these distributions that we see appear to be independent of the initial conditions. They appear to be universal in a certain sense. Um, so here's the same uh, Voronoi tessellation of Poisson distributed points in the plane that I keep showing you. Um, this is another one. This is also a Voronoi tessellation, except the points now have some kind of repulsion between them. Uh, and so you see that this is a much more regular structure. Um, and this is, again, an actual simulation that we ran. These are parts from a much bigger, bigger system. You evolve them, and you end up with things like this. They still look the same. Statistics are all identical to within our numerical resolution. So that's kind of striking. It looks like we have some, some universal structure here. If we take some initial condition and let it evolve, now we, it looks like we're beginning to come across something that's well-defined. Making it mathematically well-defined is more difficult. There's uh, actually a proposal due to Matt Kale, um, which roughly goes like this. Um, suppose that we have two of these systems. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fix a disk of a certain radius. I'm going to put it down in one system. I'm going to put it down in another system. Um, and so that disk will encompass some region in which there is some component of this three regular graph. So now I ask this question. Uh, is there a place in which I can put this disk in this system and this disk in this system such that there is an isomorphism between these three regular graphs contained within the disk? So suppose that there is some place where I can put those disks. I can then ask, what's the largest radius of a disk such that I can achieve this? Um, and by doing so, you can begin to say, well, how close are these two systems? 
Um, but that's, that's, uh, it's a conjecture. If anybody is able to make that rigorous or, or prove that that's the case, it would be, that would be amazing. Um, yeah. Isolated. As graphs. As graphs. Yes. So that's assuming you have an input system. No. Even if you have systems of this size, you can just put the disk around a single vertex. Oh, I see. Yeah. And you have a single vertex here, so that's trivial, right? That's, that's not interesting. I can take a larger one, which encompasses, say, a six-sided grain. And I can, al with you know, almost absolute certainty, find a six-sided grain somewhere in here. So the question is, how big can I make that disk while preserving the isomorphism, allowing any locations of the disks? We have no idea. But you would expect to see that. I would, absolutely. But this is this is essentially an open problem. How would you calculate the graph of this Beats me. <laughs> um, this is, I mean, this is just the first conjecture that I've ever seen about some way to make this rigorous. Don't, don't the people who study Ponzi crystals do a similar? Um, don't they make a similar thing where they say two Ponzi crystals are the same? If Matt. <laughs> just that, that I said, well, people who study Penrose tiling, for example, they say these two points are close in the space of all Penrose tiling. If you can find a big disk in one and a big disk in the other where they agree, that their agree kind of makes sense because the tiles only have like you know, a few different orientations. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know what it means for, say, even in the infinite setting here and two big disks. I think saying those two, three regular graphs are isomorphic would be pretty strong, but maybe you could say this thing is close to this. I really have no idea, but yeah, I was just suggesting to Jeremy that, you know, that there's something like this in the quasi crystal literature that might be worth looking at. I, I, what, what mm -hmm. I really like this idea. I just don't know how to approach it. So if any of you do, I, you know, that would be good. <laughs> but suppose, so suppose that something like this is true, and suppose that this, the steady state structure is a well-defined mathematical object, right? Let's, let's just take that. Um, what do we do with it? How do we start interrogating it? Um, so one way is you can start looking at grain clusters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to derive a, a property of grain clusters, and I'm going to do that using the Gauss-Binet theorem. Um, so in this context, since we're on a flat torus, this just says that uh, the integral of the scalar curvature around the boundary of some region, plus there's, uh, there's these turning angles, alpha, which are associated with all of the vertices of this, uh, the vertices on the, on the boundary of this region, D. Um, so I sum the integral of the curvature, I sum these angles, these turning angles, and that's equal to 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of the region, which is the number of components minus the number of holes. So in our case, this actually gets much more simple. Um, if you apply it to a single grain, then it's always compact and homeomorphic to a disk. So this Euler characteristic is 1, so that just simplifies right there. Um, the, uh, this term... We recall that all of the angles around the vertices are 2 pi over 3, which means that the turning angles are all pi over 3. So if this cell, if this grain has n sides, it's going to have n of these vertices. And with every one of those n vertices, you're going to associate this turning angle pi over 3. So now what we do is we rearrange this quantity. We solve for n. So if you do that, you get some relation that looks like this. So then what you do is you say, well, let's start adding those up. Um, let's just take a whole bunch of these grains. Let's take m grains. So nj is going to be the number of sides associated with the jth grain. Um, yeah, you just apply the summation, so that's fairly straightforward. Uh, you actually look at this term then, and you say, well, wait. What's going on here is I just summed the integral of the curvature around this grain and around this grain. But what happened was I traversed this edge twice in opposite senses. And I'm looking at a scalar curvature, so the contribution to this term from that edge cancels. It just vanishes. So what this term actually is, is this is just an integral of the scalar curvature around the boundary of my region R, where R is now the union of these m grains. So from this point, it's actually uh, it's not so bad to say, well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to apply this to a grain cluster. So I'm going to pick some grain in the center, which I'm going to say has exactly n sides. Um, and then there's going to be some collection of grains that border that. And there's, in fact, going to be n of them. And so what this quantity is here is this is the average of the number of sides of the neighboring grains. 
And I say, well, that's just going to be 5 plus 6 over n minus this quantity, which is the integral of uh, the scalar curvature around the boundary of this region r. Um, OK. So in general, this is kind of a complicated thing. So let's just set it to 0. Let's assume that it doesn't contribute. How good an approximation does that give us? Well, you just take these first two terms, and you can plot them as this black line here. So what this is, this is the number of sides of the central grain. This is the average number of sides of its nearest neighbors, the, grain, the grains that touch it. So you get this black line, which from the Avoir-Weir law. Um, and these blue dots correspond to the numerical results from our simulation. So you see it's actually better than you would expect, um, just dropping this integral, just setting it to 0. Um, but there's still some deviation there. So there's, some, there's something associated with this. There's some structure that hasn't been captured yet. Uh, and it's, in fact, not known um, what this is in the average case for, for one of our steady state structures. That's, that's also an open problem. So that's kind of neat. Um, this, is a, this is a very well-known result. Yep, Bob? Yeah, yeah. This is this is sampling sampling error. We don't have any zero or one-sided grains, and we don't have any fourteen or fifteen-sided grains. So yeah, that's those are not meaningful. Excuse yep. It does. Yeah, absolutely. It it depends on n. It's not it's not a constant. Well, I can absolutely give you a plot, but proving that it is such is a completely different matter. OK, well, what, what, what's, the, what's the statement? Then? I'm sorry, what do you mean? Well, well, what, uh -huh. So if you know what the plot is, what, what, so you know it scales with n, how does it scale with n? Um, I'm embarrassed. I haven't, I haven't ex looked at that extensively. Okay. Um, I, know, I know that for this, for this system, it decreases. But I mean, you can see that just from the difference of the yeah. points. But yeah. beyond that, no, I, I haven't fit some functional dependence to it. Take it would be. Um, it would be. Yes, thank you. That's a, that's a good suggestion. Um, so one thing you might do is you say, well, this is, this is kind of nice. What happens if we try to generalize it? Um, so how would you generalize it? Well, it's very common within material science to say, let's pick some, some central grain, which I've colored in red. Um, and then we say that the nearest neighbors are going to be the ones in blue. So these are the ones that share an edge with the central grain, with the red grain. So that's fairly straightforward. Um, you can extend that to the concept of next nearest neighbors. And the way you do this is you say, well, let's take all grains that we haven't included yet that share edges with the nearest neighbors. And so you get these kind of concentric rings that go out. Um, this turns out to be a kind of crude way of doing it. And you can see that because this grain has a, a very different topological relationship with the center one than, say, this does. Right? These are separated by a single edge, where these aren't. So we want to have some kind of way of, of measuring that, of distinguishing those. So what we do is we play this game with the rational numbers. Um, this is one option. There's a number of ways you can probably do this. Um, so we assign um, two numbers, 0 over 1 and 1 over 2, to the ends of this, ends of this line. And then what we do is we start adding. We add the numerators and we add the denominators. So 0 and 1 is 1. 1 and 2 gives us 3. And we put that in between these two that we've just added up. You repeat that. So 1 third and 0 over 1 gives us 1 fourth. 1 third and 1 half gives us 2 fifths. And you can just keep repeating this process. And what you end up with is this um, infinite tree where every one of the vertices is associated with three edges coming in. And remember that our grain boundary network was a three regular graph. So what let's do, let's try to take this, this tree here, and map it onto the grain boundary structure. And so that way we get to assign relationships between two grains to a rational number. Um, so how do you do that? Well, um, let's assign 0 over 1 to this center grain. How do we get to 1 half? Well, so this is a special case. Let's make all the nearest neighbors 1 half. So you might get something like this. And then what you do is you say, well, I'm going to start here at this vertex, and I'm going to travel down one edge. And then I'm going to hit this grain. So what's the number I'm going to associate with that one? Well, if I start here and I travel down one edge, I hit 1 third. 
So let's make this grain and this one and this one and this one all one third. And that's fine. How about this one? So I go down an edge and then I turn left. So here I go down an edge and then I turn left and I hit one fourth. So let's make that one one fourth. And then you can keep going. Oh, that actually came out darker than I was expecting. Excuse me. Um, so you go down an edge, turn left, and then right. And to get to this one, so down an edge, left and right, so two sevenths. So those ones out there end up as two sevenths. Um, and you can repeat this process. There are certain symmetries that are involved that I'm kind of sweeping underneath the rug, but you get the idea. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. There's actually, um, so there's no reason to distinguish between paths that are left and right mirror images of each other. Right? There's no physical reason. There's no physical reason for that. So practically what that means is that we just apply some mirror symmetry around one third. Um, and that's, that's one of the complications I was not expecting to talk about. But yes, that's very good, Constantine. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so you can extend this, and you end up with this very precise relationship uh, between these two grains. So what happens if you try to ap apply something like the Abweb Weir law to this? Well, um, these blue dots are the ones that you were seeing before. So given some number of sides of a red grain, this is the average number of sides of its nearest neighbors, the blue. So one half are right here. If you go out to one third, so these ones that are only separated from the central grain by a single edge, uh, and you do the same calculation, you end up with this. So whereas there's a negative correlation between the numbers of sides of the center and its nearest neighbors, there's a positive correlation between the center grain and the ones that are related by one third. If you go further out to these purple ones, there's in fact no correlation. So we can, there's a measurable difference here. We can actually measure that this is, uh, that there's some, the, uh, there's some real information associated with this, that so th these grains are topologically distinct. So the guys at 12 and 13, they're uh, north dots, you think it's? Numerical error. Sample. Yeah, yeah, it's a small sample size. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's probably uh, tens of thousands of instances that are averaged in this region and tens that are averaged in this region. Um, just because you get very, very few grains. This is one of the strange things about our structures. You get very few grains um, with 12 sides, 13 sides. They're just very rare. And actually none with 14 or 15. Um, so this is nice. Um, you can, in fact, now that we're interested in this relationship between grains and in this topological uh, aspects of the structure, you can do something a little more sophisticated. Can you go back to the green ones? To the green ones. So why do you think they're because if you have a small number of sides, three sides, yeah. the number, I understand. you understand positive correlation. <laughs> um, so my, no, um, no, what I, my, so the story I tell myself is suppose that this grain in the center is shrinking, right? Suppose that it's, it's losing sides. What happens every time it loses a side is it pushes one of these nearest neighbors, the, one of the blue ones, out, and the nearest neighbor becomes a, a green. It becomes a one-third. Okay? okay. Um, so you say, all right, well, the center grain is shedding sides. It's pushing these blue ones out to become green ones. It's a natural question. Which one is it going to push out to become a green one? Is it going to push out a very large grain? which on average is going to have a lot of length associated with every one of its edges, or is it going to push out a small grain, which is going to have less length associated with its edges? So uh, in, uh, the story I tell myself is the second is more likely. So of these blue grains, the ones that get ejected tend to be the ones with fewer numbers of sides. So that's, that's why I tell myself that this is suppressed and that you only see this effect for grains that are shrinking. Um, but we haven't been able to, to back that up you know, other than a kind of heuristic. Well, I so. think it's fair to say this, this measurement is only a couple of weeks old. So That's okay. true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. okay. So you might try to do something a little more sophisticated. Um, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to put down some additional structure. 
So the way we're going to do that, we're going to put down these points. Um, and I'm going to refer to these as full flags or complete flags, uh, every one of these, these dots that I just placed on the structure. And every one of these dots is associated with some cell that it sits inside and some edge that it's near and some vertex that it's near. Um, so all right, you know, it's every one of these, um, and that's true for every one of these flags, and every flag has a distinct triplet. No two flags have the same set of cell, edge, and vertex. Uh, and so the next thing that I do is I start putting down uh, ways to travel between them. So there's three kinds of relationships here. Um, there's one between two of these flags that have the same cell and same edge, but different vertices, and so that's in purple. And there's one between two flags that have the same cell and vertex, but different edges, and that's in yellow. And there's one here in blue between two flags that have the same edge and vertex, but different cells. Um, and for those of you that know some group theory, this, is, this comes from a Coxeter group. This is the Dinkin diagram. Um, and so we can label these elements by either the colors or you know, these operations, S0, S1, and S2. Um, but that's, that's not, yeah, that's just a side note. Um, great, so what can we do with this? Well, uh, there's lots of nice things about this. Part of, one of them is that uh, every flag is, you know, if you're sitting at a flag, uh, you always have these three operations. You never have any more, you never have any less. So in some sense, all the flags are identical. Um, what's more is I tell you um, that, suppose that you're interested in the stabilizer. Right. Suppose that you're interested in the combination of these operations that pick some base flag and return you to that base flag. So I might run around this path, or I might run around this path and then return. Um, if I have the set of stable, if I have the full stabilizer for any f base flag, what I claim is that I can reconstruct the entire topology of the system. That that stabilizer contains all topological information. Uh, and you can do this kind of by a constructive manner. Suppose that you have some base flag and you just you put it somewhere in the plane. It's not really important where. Um, and you look at, say, one of the elements of the stabilizer. Right? Suppose that element of the stabilizer was just composed of these yellow and uh, purple operations. So you would run around the interior of some grain. So if that's true, if that element is in the stabilizer, you can put down some edges associated with that. And you can just, on the basis of um, well, on the basis of very little, um, figure out that there's going to be these additional elements that travel out from every one of these vertices. You can, in fact, get this entire region out just from that one component of the stabilizer. So then you go to some more complicated component, which may you know, pass over one of these edges into another grain and then return. So you can put that down. And you can repeat this process. You can keep taking successively longer and more complicated elements of the stabilizer and build up the complete topology. And so this is true for any base flag. If you have the complete stabilizer, you know everything about the topology. Um, so that's kind of nice. Uh, what do you do with that? Well, so here's one idea. Um, let's suppose that we no longer look at a single base flag. Let's take a whole bunch of base flags. So in this case, I've taken five. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at how much of the structure around these base flags I can reconstruct as I allow my maximum path length to become longer and longer. So in this case, if we only allow paths of length zero, you don't get anything. You just get these isolated base flags. Um, and what's more is you know that, you can, you can show it without too much difficulty, that paths can only close if they have an even number of operations. That's fairly straightforward. So you're going to see this increment by two every time. So you don't see anything for four, paths of length four, nothing for length six. For length eight, you start getting stuff appearing. Um, you get these two four-sided grains. And so in particular, I'm not just interested in, um, in when these things appear. What I'm actually interested in is distinguishing kinds of flags, distinguishing kinds of base flags as a function of n. So for n uh, equal to 0, 2, 4, and 6, there was only one kind of base flag in the system, right? just these isolated things. As soon as we hit 8, now we have two kinds of base flags. We have two that are associated with these four-sided grains and three that are still empty. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the rules here. It yep. seems like you could have gone out an edge and crossed and come back and gone four steps and come back. Like, you 
tracing opposite. Yeah, so, so one of the things that I'm doing is I'm explicitly disallowing um, trivial operations. Um, trivial operations, meaning if I'm running around this circuit along an edge or I'm running around this circuit around a vertex. Those are explicitly disallowed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're actually built into the structure of the group, and so there's no additional information there that's just kind of left over. Um, yeah, so is that, is that clear? All right. So in this case, we have two kinds of base flags. Um, n, e n equals 10, you don't get any additional paths. N equals 12, we suddenly get a whole bunch of new things. You get, uh, this is a six-sided grain here and a five-sided grain associated with this flag. Here's a six-sided grain, and you get an additional five-sided grain right here. So in this case, now we have um, all five of these are distinct. Once, n, once I get up to n equals 12, I can distinguish all five of these flags on the basis of the, uh, the structure that I can reconstruct around them. And you can continue this process. It's actually after n equals 12, um, the stuff that you can add onto these proliferates very, very quickly. Um, and so you can imagine that out at past a certain length, say n equals 30 or so, I'm going to be able to distinguish almost every base flag in my system on the basis of the amount of structure that I can rebuild around it. So what can I do with that? Well, let's, um, let's start looking at entropies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some structure like this, some grain structure. I'm going to put down these flags. And what I'm going to do is as a function of n, this maximum path length, I'm going to say, um, what are the classes that I can put my base flags into? How many of these classes are there? I get some discrete probability distribution over classes of base flags as a function of n. Since it's a discrete probability distribution, I can just write up a Shannon entropy. This log f is just, I mean, this is not important. This is just a normalizing factor to make this be uh, bound between 0 and 1. But really, all I'm doing is I'm looking at a Shannon entropy as a function of the path length. So for this hexagonal lattice, Every one of these base flags is identical. For any path length, they always look the same. So I only have one class, there's only one term in here, and this is identically zero, which is what it should be, because this is a very ordered system. Let's take something a little more complicated. So this is um, a Voronoi tessellation of points in the plane with some repulsion between them. Um, and so what this does is it elevates the number of six-sided grains, five-sided grains, seven-sided and it lowers the number of three-sided and seven-sided, and uh, three-sided and eight-sided and nine-sided. So this is tightly clustered around six sides. Uh, and you get some distribution that looks like this. So in particular, when I'm down here at zero or four or six um, for my maximum path length, all of the flags still look the same. They all still are just bare. If I'm up here around maximum path length 30, I can distinguish every base flag in my system. Every one of them now has a unique structure that I've rebuilt around it. And in between here, we have some um, you know, relatively continuous function. It's discrete. But uh, so what happens if I put in other things? I can test other, other structures. Uh-huh. Finite. And part of this, if you had an infinite graph. Yeah, it's not. An entropy, whereas the saturation is due to the finite system. Yes. But you could define this function even. Well, so it's, it's actually, it's not clear. System? It's not clear that this saturation is, is due to it being finite. Okay. It's possible that in the case of an infinite graph, if you were to go out to path length 40 or 50, is that true? Yeah, I don't know. Like I don't know. I hadn't, I hadn't actually thought about that. That's a really interesting thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. These are very large systems we're working with. These contain hundreds of thousands of cells. So equivalently, hundreds of thousands of base flags. Um, and as you increase the system size, so the path length is very small compared to the size of the system. Here. Yeah, it's it's and minuscule. It's still yeah, it's yeah. So actually, uh, you can you can think about this um, if you think about it in the following way. You say that there's six operations to go across the diameter of a six-sided grain. So you say, well, we need to go out six operations, to and then have we have we have to close the circuit. So we have to have six go back, right? So if you get out here to length twelve, you're approximately going around a single grain. If you got it here to length 24 or so, you might go around uh, four grains and then return. Right. But that's still a very localized area. Right. That's a very small region. I just would expect the information to continuously increase as you go further. I was kind of expecting that too, but 
it saturates very quickly. Um, and this, this graph here seems to be pretty independent of how big I make my finite system. It's, it seems to be pretty robust, which I was not expecting. Um, so there's other systems that I can work with. Instead of this Voronoi tessellation of these points that have a little bit of repulsion, I can look at, say, our steady state structure which has slightly more entropy. So in this case, I'm not defining entropy as a number. I'm defining it as a function. And I can order these things by when the function is, um, one, one function is above another. So in this case, our steady state structure co uh, comes in in this blue. And so you see that if we were to evolve from this condition to this one, the entropy of the system would increase. On the other hand, here's a, a Voronoi tessellation of points that are just randomly distributed. And you get this dark blue curve, which is, and I'm sorry about this, the resolution is not so good because these are almost on top of one another. But the entropy of this is slightly higher. This function is slightly higher. So what that means is if you evolve from here to here, your entropy might go down slightly. Um, so I'm, I'm, in fact, quite happy with this because we now have some kind of ordering of these structures. Uh, I wish that it was a number instead of a function because then we could apply, hopefully, um, more more familiar notions from thermodynamics, um, but I'm still, I'm still pleased with this. So is that, is that clear what the game I'm playing? Um, what you can distinguish them. Each base flag belongs to a unique type of structure. Yes. Yeah. So if you have hundreds of thousands, or actually I think some of these were from millions, if you, even in the case where you have millions of base flags, if you tell me the elements of the stabilizer for that base flag, up to length 30, I can identify every base flag in the system on the basis of just those components of the stabilizer. Every one of them is unique. Can you say a little bit, a bit more about the normalizing factor? Is that different in each one of your cases? Well, so this, this F is just the number of base flags in the system, right? So all that I'm doing is I'm saying when, uh, so this is, this is some attempt to um, normalize out by the system size. Right, um, and so that's that's why all of these are bound between zero and one because I think these may not all be exactly the same size. They're both very large. They're all very large, on the order of hundreds of thousands of grains, I think. But um, yes, absolutely. Well, it has everything to do with length scales. Oh, no, no, no. This, the metric, yeah, the induced metric is not part of this. So, do you know how to create graphs so that you could just keep <coughs> pushing your entropy higher and higher? No. No, we know how to actually get from here to here, right? That's not so difficult. What you start doing is you just, you can take a graph like this and you can start flipping edges. And you just keep flipping edges, and you have to relax the structure a little bit to, you know, to keep the edges non-intersecting and things like that. You can't let the number of sides of any cell go below two. Uh, there's a bunch of things you have to do, but you just keep flipping edges. And what happens is uh, you get this, this continuous um, family of curves that go just from zero all the way up to, I think you can get, you can get pretty close to this one without too much difficulty. Um, but above this, no. I haven't found anything above that, and there's nothing obvious to me to try. Um, I mean, do you have any ideas, Constantine? No, no, no. I, I think <laughs> it could be. It's not a simple one. No, no, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, but. Yeah, um, there we do. So actually, let me get to the next part, right? That'll that'll speak a little bit to this. Um, this is yeah. Could you mm -hmm. to the uh, two circles you drew before? To the two circles that I drew before? Possibly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I I hadn't actually thought about that. Thought about there being a connection there. Um, yeah, about mapping about some isomorphism exact existing in some region between two different graphs. I don't know. I don't know. All of these are very new results. So, um, so there's a little bit more, um, which I would like to share with you because of a question of Constantine's. 
So um, this was related to a question over here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Um, but he was asking about uh, relations that we have for paths that run around edges or around these vertices. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to enforce a canonical form of the elements of this group, a canonical form for the elements of the stabilizer. So, so let's say that we start with some base flag here. This contains some structural information. This tells me that there's a non-trivial circuit there, that it closes. Um, this, however, doesn't give me any additional information. This is a different path. This is a different sequence of operations. But all I've done is I've kind of pushed it. I just kind of nudge it over one of the vertices. Um, and similarly, this doesn't give me any new information. I've just kind of pushed it over the edge, and I can push it along here. And in fact, I can do this a lot. Um, there's an infinite number of ways that I can do this. Just by taking the same path, and all I'm doing is I'm adding. Right? You can kind of think about it as me adding little loops around the vertices or around the edges. And there's always, you know, there's going to be an infinite number of ways I can do this. So those are all distinct paths, but they don't give me distinct information. What I really want is I want to exclude all of those. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all of the paths of this type into an equivalence class. And I'm only going to examine one element of that equivalence class, which is this guy. This is the, the shortest element of an equivalence class is not always unique. But you can show that one of the shortest elements will always have this type, always have this form. Um, so if you run around the interior of one of these cells, then it will have this form. This S0, S1 just means purple and yellow operations. So I'm just running around the interior here. Every time you see an S2, what that means is I'm hopping between cells. So this just says I have a sequence of uh, purple and yellow, and I'm running around, and then I jump. And then I have a sequence of purple and yellow, and then I jump. You can always find one of the shortest paths in every equivalence class of that kind. Okay. Uh, you can, in fact, restrict it even more. Because this still allows for you to do things like run around the interior of this cell a whole bunch of times. There's no new information there. Or I can run around this one twice, and then around here once, and then around here twice again. It doesn't give me any new information either. So what I want to do is I want to only take uh, group elements, paths, that enclose regions homeomorphic to a disk. So I don't allow self-intersections. OK, so I do that. Then what I do is I say, well, let's look at um, the elements of the stabilizers for all flags in my system. I'm now looking at statistics independent of base flag. And I say, well, what are the most frequent paths of this kind that f are fall into this canonical form and that do not self-intersect? I get these 10 paths. These are the 10 most frequent ones. Here's the most frequent. You have a six-sided cell connected by two edges to a five-sided cell a 6 connected by 3 edges to a 5. And then if you keep looking, you actually have a 6 connected to a 5 by 4 edges. Uh, and that progression continues. It kind of intermeshes with another progression, where you have a 7-sided cell and a 6-sided cell connected by 2, connected by 3. Uh, I think the one where they're connected by 4 is off the end of this. You have a 7 connected to a 5 by 2, 7 connected to a 5 by 3, 6 and 6, 6 and 6. And then you have this funny one which we weren't expecting, and it took us a long time to figure out what that was. But the point I'm making here is that all of the most frequent paths are very short. Somehow, there's a whole bunch of indications that the majority of the information in this formulation is contained in short paths, that I can distinguish so many of my base flags only looking at paths up to length 30, that all of the most frequent paths, the most frequent components of the structure are always of this kind. So there's something very significant there, and we're not quite sure what it is, but we're trying to extract some kind of length scale associated with this, length scale associated with disorder on this graph. But it's, that's not precise. Um, so I think I'm going to stop here. Um, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? <laughs>